Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Untamed Intimacy. I am really excited to have a different kind of conversation today with a new yet fast friend, Matthew Stillman, who is a man of many talents and many areas of study. Um, He's had a lifelong study and practice with various aspects of Eastern and Western spiritual bodies and a discipline and many years of deep engagement with long form improv comedy, which is one of the things that really stands out to me about you. Um, He is a man of many creative hats and in fact, offers consultancy to New York strangers on the street um, and offers creative approaches to what they've been struggling with, big or small, personal or professional, mundane or profoundly esoteric. Um, Matthew helps people look at whatever is burdening them in new ways. And Something that really strikes me about him as well is on the other side of all of this, he has a very deep study and dedication to the tantric arts and has also authored a book called Genesis Deflowered, which is a book of biblical erotica, which I find to be amazing. Um, And I'd I'd love to hear more about that. Um, And he's also a lifelong New Yorker, a lover of language, culture, and a practitioner of bigger questions wondering aloud and sitting in mystery. He's also a student of the Orphan Wisdom School, which I have no idea what that is, but I'm excited to hear more. So Matthew, in all of your many talents and many lives lived, welcome. Thank you so much, ladies. Good to see your face. Likewise, likewise. Um, So let's start with how we even came into conversation. Um, we've discovered many things throughout our conversations about overlaps in our lives that I had no idea about, but tell me, or, you know, tell everyone who's listening a little more about the work you're doing now, because this was our meeting point. So, uh, a mutual friend of ours, um, well, actually that's not true. Um, uh, a man who we both know, who I'm acquainted with, but don't really know beyond much else, um, he is good friends with a friend of mine named Kendra Holiday. Kendra Holiday is a um, woman who lives in St. Louis, who is a, um, a sexual surrogate and a sex coach, um, who runs uh, a great uh, sex community, although obviously not now in uh, Corona times, but uh, called uh, Sex Positive St. Louis, doing ed- educational stuff. And she is remarkable. And her website is The Beautiful Kind. Um, so she and I are close, and so this guy um, was talking with her, and she said, you've got to talk to my friend Matthew, because this guy, who we both know, is a sexual surrogate, uh, and had not reached out to me thinking that I was a sexual surrogate, um, and said, I wanted to talk to another man who does sexual surrogacy work, because that's so rare. And so he was all excited to talk about sexual surrogacy work, but I don't do surrogacy, but not that there's a problem with that, I just don't do it. Um, And so I've been, uh, we shared our conversation about the intersections between his surrogacy work and my work in the, in tantric body work, uh, which I've been doing as a professional for just about eight years now. Um, And in the the conversation, he said, oh, you've, you must know Lee Noto. I'm like, I don't know that I do, but maybe, but I don't think so. He says, oh, you've got to, like you, she's a New Yorker and she's so smart and she's so interesting. Like, You've got him, you know, I'm like, great, if you you come on, you know, a recommendation from Kendra, like, I'm sure you're fine, like, our conversation's been lovely. I'm sure Lee Meadow is fantastic. And so, um, in our reaching out, I recognize that I, you and I have another mutual friend, Lila Donalo, you'd been on her podcast. Lila is a dear old friend of mine. And I had listened to your, your episode, which came out, like, two or three years ago, but I didn't really sort of connect the name or the face, but I didn't know your face at all. And so, and then we, in our conversations together, we found out that we both worked at the uh, the same place in New York, which was its own, that's, I don't know how much down the rabbit hole you want to go, but there were a number of intersections uh, that we sort of like just missed each other at, uh, having to do around sex, intimacy, and spirit. Yeah, yeah. Um, It's such a fascinating story how people are connected. The world is very small. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So, okay. I know for some people listening, 
they have never heard of sexual surrogacy work before. They've never heard of tantric body work. Yep. So as a, a practitioner, what are the differences? What is sexual sur surrogacy work? What is tantric body work? And you know, how do people find themselves seeking practitioners of these sorts? Yeah, so I'd say surrogacy um, is a type of re uh, paid relationship between uh, one person who's seeking help or guidance or support and a person who is the surrogate, who uh, for pay does the, the modeling physical, uh, physical presence and communication skills to help someone feel better or more possible to have sexual experiences which can include intercourse. So in, it is not just this, but it could be people who are too shy, haven't developed the social skills um, to engage in that, or have particular obstacles which make it hard for them to engage in those spaces, which could be disabilities, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but it really, I'd say, is a, an educational space, a teaching space, as much as it is an emotional, sexual one, uh, which also could, of course, have spiritual dimensions as well. They also tend to be uh, bounded in time. So not, I wouldn't say this is universal, but you know, like we're gonna have no more than 20 sessions or uh, again, I'm sure there are exceptions to that, but in my experience, that's uh, what that is. And so if, I know people who've had it, who are quote unquote, totally fine, but sort of need help with a particular thing, but don't wanna sort of uh, feel as, uh, Weird is just hiring a prostitute, hiring someone who actually has cultivated particular skills around whatever it is, but presence in particular would be a surrogate. Um, I would say that um, erotic body work, um, I would say tantric is the one term that I use because I have a, a deep practice and history of my own, which is lifelong in the Indian space, studying the spiritual dimensions of tantra and how that intersects with some of the sexual spaces, but it's not necessarily sexually focused. So, I would, but also Tantra sort of has a trigger for a lot of people like, it means sex, which it doesn't, but it means that for a lot of people. So, but I'd say generally erotic body workers uh, are sought out because people are not seeking to have sexual intercourse, but are seeking to be supported with a sexual dimension in their touch that can help them move spiritual and sexual energy through their bodies to help move things in their lives. Um, but it also could be for people who, um, who give all the time and don't receive, or people who um, have a hard time touching, you know, getting in touch with their body, need someone to lead them through it. There's lots of reasons why you, know, that you might want to, if you want to have a more sexual dimension to massages that you have, just because you want um, and they don't need to be generally focused, but they, are, they include genitals. Yeah, thank you for making those distinctions. Um, it's, you know, something that I see in the overlap between both of those, uh, both of those professions is that there is an element of education many times. Sure. And, you know, I know each practitioner keeps his or her own practice. In my experience, you know, there is such a beautiful element of having someone hold space for you in a way that we might not be comfortable asking a partner to, or we don't have the language to um, navigate sexual, sexual experiences with confidence, with skill, with practice. And it's fascinating. You know, it really blows my mind that these lines of work are still considered so taboo and, you know, the reasons why we could go down an entire rabbit hole for that, but world, yeah. this is some of the most important work that exists. Like nobody taught us how to engage with ourselves and with others sexually, or that there is a huge intersection between sexuality and spirituality, how to navigate conversations, how to navigate bodily sensations, how to navigate uh, presence in in sexual experiences and so first of all I want to thank you for doing this work and for being an example of 
of someone in the world who is guiding others on their journey through things that can be, feel very challenging, very wrought with trauma and narratives. And so, you know, I, I stand behind my support for anyone in the sex work industry, the sex work adjacent industry, you know, it gets a really bad rap and that's, you know, that is not the entirety of what happens in these professions is what we're seeing on TV. So thank you for making that distinction. Um, as a practitioner of tantric body work, and I'm, I'm, I know that your professional capabilities span far beyond that, what have you seen as the biggest, most profound impacts of being a practitioner of the work and of guiding clients through this work? When you say impacts, you mean impacts on myself or? Impacts on yourself and impacts on clients. I'm sure clients come back to you and share breakthroughs they've had or. They do, and sometimes they happen on, you know, in the space together. Um, I mean, I would say that one of the things that is, you know, that's very moving to me that happens, well, I'll give you a, a very particular, I'll, give, I'll tell you a story. Um, a woman came to me um, and said, you know, you came highly recommended. My girlfriend said you were great. And I want to, I think it's time. I've never had a G-spot orgasm. I need to have a G-spot orgasm. And I don't, and you know, I don't, like my lover is great, but he's never been able to do it. So I'm coming to you. And I'm like, well, that's great. Um, but I can't guarantee you you're, you're going to have one. This is the first time that we've met. I can't wrench one out of you. And so, but I'm glad to know <laughs> that that's your intention. And I'm not trying to make you have a peak experience. I'm trying to actually have you feel the capacity for what's in your body and see what, what emerges. And she's like, okay, great. But I definitely want a G-spot orgasm. I'm like, great. Good to know. And so I went to her home. We started however we started. And um, somewhere through halfway through the session, I was, I asked, um, would you like your breast worked on? Which is, you know, I've, the genitals part of the body work that I do tends to be the last part of the session because you don't want to just sort of leap right to the genitals. Um, the whole body can be turned on and i would just say that this woman was amply bosomed let's just like be kind about that um and she said like okay fine but but like get it over with like let's get to the the action i'm like okay but i want to pay every part of and i'm not a, like a super talky person during sessions but i'm not averse to talking but i said like we just need to also address your breast too. And so she sort of rolled her eyes, she's like, and I'm like, you're, this isn't cutting off any time. Like you're, I'm not gonna like, I'm not hitting a timer that like when we hit two hours that like the session's over, like you're not losing anything here. And in the, the midst of working on her breasts, she started to weep, like uncontrollably sob. Wow. Um, and she, through her tears, she said, I've never felt my breasts have this much sensation. Uh -huh. And we, in that first session, we never even got to her genitals at all. Um, and when we were done and we spoke the next day, which is part of my sessions, she said, you know, people have always treated my, my tits like, things to squeeze and grab and people and all my lovers have treated my nipples like radio dials because mm. like she's and like she had big beautiful breasts like that's true but you know and so she said to me like I didn't even realize that I sort of had shut off sensation so I'd feel less of that grabbiness wow and so she had all the sorrow and that wasn't the first time you know, but but she just said like that crying was like a huge relief. She said, and she's described it as a grief orgasm. Um, and of course, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say a grief orgasm is on the scale of, you know, vaginal, cervical, anal, you know, nipple, like whatever. 
it was like a very particular type of thing. When, and I didn't walk yeah. in knowing that I, you know, that that was there, that that mm -hmm. could happen, that that would happen or should happen, but, um, or will happen again. But what that reminded me of is that so often the work that I do, despite there are tremendous joys in it, that uh, to be a woman in this time and place asks so much of you um, that you're sort of on the menu for breakfast every day. And so the, uh, and certainly your sexuality is as well, it's being trafficked and traded in, um, that how much uh, grief needs to be able to be skillfully held in order to be in the presence of the joys in the body. Not that they need to happen at the same time, they need to be in like, you know, one after the other, but just that there is, you can't just sort of go up the joy scale, um, that there are sorrows in the body that need to be shaken loose and shaken free or reckoned with, even if they can't ever go, because that could be scarring or damage or like physical scarring or damage. And so in terms of like what I've learned or recognized or been wrecked by is the, the tenderness that, that so many women walk around with without even knowing no matter how tough or awesome or capable or, and not to say that everyone is, but just that it's broad and often people who can't find their way in a trustworthy way um, from whispered from one ear to another, from one woman to another, who think that somehow I'm a good idea, but that's something that often is present. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I got chills while you were talking and I could feel tears well up in the back of my eyes because I think all humans can relate to this, but as a woman, I know what it's like to carry like epic amounts of pain and fear and sorrow and anger, heartbreak. as well as heartbreak, as well as joy and bliss. Heart. And, you know, we have the capacity for all of these things, yet because of gender norms and, and things of this nature, many women are taught to not express these things because yeah. we'll be, we're too emotional or if we're angry, you're we're a bitch, the, yeah, we're raging. Not, you're not the good girl, you're not in control, sure. Right, and so as we walk around carrying this in our bodies, we've conditioned ourselves into and have very well been conditioned by society and, and other, you know, other things to think that our sexual expression has to fit into a box and it's got to be the way it looks in porn because that's our sexual education and you know yep. poorly written high school textbooks and then maybe if we're lucky a sex talk from mom and dad but probably a misguided one yep. and you know we carry all of this trauma and these stories and these past experiences with us in our bodies and our psyches and it just strikes me as profound that, that there is work that exists in the world for people to be held in that and to be seen and witnessed because the most important thing here, especially when it comes to sexual liberation, and I think liberation in general, is feeling so safe, feeling safe, feeling held so that the organism can actually surrender. And what is orgasm but a deep surrender into the moment into the expansion and contraction in the body into, you know, in spiritual context into God. And so that, oh, yeah. yeah, that people have a place to do this is again, the, the deepest work I think that exists out there. And um, I'm just so grateful to be having a conversation about this. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's very touching. And, you know, of course, part of the unspoken heartbreak of that is that, it is so sad to me that my profession in this space needs to exist. Like, and so to, that doesn't make me special. Like I stumbled into how I did this work. That's its own story. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's undoing to consider the fact that we live in such a touch starved society that no one learned how to touch well. You know, th that woman who had a, a grief orgasm through her breasts had, you know, let's just say that she never actually experienced any like sexual trauma in the sense of, you know, being beaten or 
raped, any sort of like hor like truly horrible thing like that. So let's just say that she quote unquote suffered small low grade traumas of being you know consensually grabbed, but just too hard enough. Well, like let's say that was ten men. Well, like what sort of wake is left from that? That those men didn't learn how to touch anything better because they never had a chance to actually touch a breast or see a breast touched, you know, in person to see here's the way you do it. Um, I mean, just as a, someone recently asked me, um, hey, I've really found that like, my sexual arousal goes up when I take shrooms. I really want to do um, shrooms with my lover. What do you think of that? And I said, honestly, you, unless you can find three people who you know and trust to completely surrender your will to, who can sit around the two, you and your partner having sex and hold, and watch without getting involved, you shouldn't do it because you're seriously compromising your capacity to make good decisions and you're not being witnessed. And she was like, wow, no one's ever watched me have sex and not get involved and not be close. I'm like, yeah, that's a real poverty that most people don't even know that they've hadn't had. What's the what's the power? I mean, what in in your experience is the power of having a witness in these sexual and spiritual transformations? Well, you know, it's hard to be objective if you're yourself. Um, you know, we live in an elder free. We have lots of olders, not necessarily a lot of elders, um, and so this would have been a, another layer of. Uh, things to say to this woman, you know, and they can't be your peers. They need to like the people who like know who the fuck, what, what the fuck they're doing. Um, but that's, that's hard to come by all on its own. But the power of it is that, um, well, again, I sort of take a half step away and say that the people are so often told in our time that they have to believe in themselves and to, um, trust how smart they are and how good they are and like pull yourself, do all these things because of your internal sense of locus of control of how much capacity you have and read affirmations to say, I'm the best, I'm the smartest, I'm capable, I'm gonna make my dreams come true, whatever. Uh, and a lot of, you know, self-help things uh, or spiritual things, quote unquote, sort of guide us towards like recognize your own power, feel the goddess coming through you, you know, rise up in your handstand, feel Kundalini opening up for your enlightenment, which will then open the world. Like, oh, great, okay, gross. All that stuff's totally gross to me, but it is essentially saying, I don't need other people, and you're doing the work of a village. And properly rendered, you wouldn't ever have to believe in yourself because you know through action, through experience that there are 10 people around you who have demonstrated that they believe in you. Like, oh, I'm, I don't know what to even think about myself, but this person thinks I'm amazing? Well, they've always been right, or almost always been right, or they've almost always been wise. I'm gonna trust what, you know, whoever this other person is. And so it's a huge burden for you to have to say, I'm doing all the, the work of all this. So the, the capacity of being witnessed is for you to actually have to not hold on so tight to analyzing, looking, um, doing cross analysis, connecting to all the things that you know in the mo moments after you had amazing sex. You say like, what happened? Yeah, that's a brilliant point because um, I mean, I've, I've experienced the power of being witnessed by friends and loved ones and having people witness me in my relationship with my partner has been incredible because different aspects of us come through in those experiences. Sure. Um, and it's, it, it really is a burden to carry the weight of what you're saying, analysis, cross-examination, needing to feel sovereign within ourselves and also hold space for our partners and then be present with the entire experience altogether and be aware of what's happening with them all of all of these dynamics and, and you don't even know it's burden because it's normal oh uh, we're carrying it all the time for right. sure we're just like well this is just the way it is and people don't don't get why why do i feel exhausted why do i feel overwhelmed why is my relationship hard well it could be that you're trying to any relationship that's worth carrying 
is too big for two people. Mm. It doesn't mean that suddenly you should launch into being polyamorous, but just the relationship, if it's worth carrying, requires yeah. people, requires more shoulders. Properly. That's fascinating. And that that is the beauty of community. And even, you know, we're 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 talking about sort of sexuality and community and, and all of these things in one. Um, but even having someone as a witness in our individual transformation, whether that be a partner or someone else is really, really supportive. Um, and it's, it's fascinating the kind of transformation that happens in when you're in the presence of another nervous system, like just from a physiological perspective. And that's what I think is, you know, one of the huge powers of the work that you do is that you, the, the person, the clients, when they come to you, they've been undoubtedly carrying burdens, traumas, stories, and or they want to optimize their experience and, and learn something new and expand. And it yeah. can sometimes be very challenging to go it alone, nor yeah. should we have to. And so I, I, I really do see you as a shepherd of sexuality, spirituality, and, and finding the merging point between the two. Yeah, thank you. That, that intersection is very uh, moving to me. And I I love the word shepherd because it has sort of like this loving tendingness to it as opposed to being leader or a guide because there's a lot of following the sh sheep that the shepherd does too. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I feel very uh, yeah, enriched by having that word, which is not one that I've used for myself um, in that, but I it has the, a ring of like, oh yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm mindful that there may still be some people listening that have some idea about what you do, but are still wanting the, the blanks filled in. What does a typical session look like? And share as much detail as you feel comfortable sharing, but what kind of container do you create? Because the work that you do is way different than you know, yes. going to a massage parlor and getting a happy ending. And there's nothing wrong with that work, by the way. Sure. And it's different than what you do. So yeah, we'll paint, paint a picture for us. Yeah, it's also really different from a lot of other body workers do too. Um, there are not a lot of men that do what I do. And I work primarily with women, but not only with women. Um, but even amongst the, the men who I work with uh, and, and amongst the other men who do this work, um, I'd say that the, what my approach, which is not necessarily better, is a unique one. Um, that said, what does a session look like? So I will have a, uh, a phone session with someone first when they inquire, or they sort of ask a little bit of the question that you're asking. I'll tell them, I'll answer whatever questions they have, whatever brought them to my digital door, uh, who they got referred to, what their sort of you know, wishes and wants are. And then in that, I will tell them what I'm about to tell you, but I also will say to them, included in the session is a follow-up session that can be on the phone or in person the next day or the day after, where we can talk about the session so you can actually feel the full experience of the witnessing. That's included in the price. Um, to ask any questions, ask for more resources, just reflect back, whatever, and you don't have to take that. Um, but also that they won't hear from me again. After our session, um, that, that follow-up session if they want it, uh, is to let them know that they are not put on any mailing list. They do not need to be contacted in three months to, to find out that, you know, that my you know, work is now 30% off because again, their sexuality is already marketed to enough. Um, that, uh, and they don't need me to reach out to say like, hey, Ellen, do you need more, like, more work on your pussy done? Like, let's do it. Like, they're, Agency is everything. And so there are women who I've worked with 50, 70 times, but it's always been because they decide, I want to work with you. So I don't sell packages and I let them know that. Um, so that's the first thing about the way a session goes. The way the session goes is that I work 95% of time I meet in someone's home, but it's in their space because it's the, the sessions themselves are, you know, two, two and a half hours ish, but like there's not a timer. Um, and also when you've had this experience, you don't want to have to sort of like gather all your energy up um, 
get onto a bus or a subway or deal with coronavirus or not that I've done any sessions during coronavirus time, but um, but just to be able to stay there for as much time as you need and let the thing unfold. So it's much easier to be in your own space and for you to say, as I leave, I left a payment under the bananas and I take it and walk away. Um, but I've done it in hotel rooms and people's piano terres and aunt's houses or any number of places. I've done it in beaches, I mean, I've, all over the place. So when I come to the house, I will, uh, we'll sit from each other, we'll have sort of a, an entrance in where we just sort of feel the weight of the body and feel and start to condition the nervous system to actually be open. Not trying to get you to be sympathetic or parasympathetic or make your vagus nerve do anything particular, but just to actually let it be responsive in the moment by feeling the weight of the body, opening up the, so that's the sense of touch, opening up the sense of listening. Um, and then we, that takes a few minutes. Then we play two games. One is we play the game of no, where I ask really boring, silly questions about, can I touch you on your nose? Can I touch your hair? Can we bump elbows? And practice you having the word no on your tongue because it's very easy for women to say yes or it's fine. Um, and for, again, to condition them to see that it's not a big deal for me to hear a no because it's usually the first time that I meet people. The rules change slightly after I've worked with someone more than once, but most sessions of mine are first sessions. Um, so we play this game of no, and that's, you know, is a way to bring some delight into it, because this is not, you know, it's not all you know, serious and spiritual, like you want some levity in here too, um, and any observations that come up with them. And then we do this other game that's called the long tail of touch. So we take their hands, we have them clap, uh, instead of palm to palm, but palm to back of your hand, make three really big hits, whack, 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 really hard, really fast, and then we sit there in silence until the sensation in both hands is gone. And that can take anywhere from two to 10 minutes. And we're just sitting there in silence, feeling whatever happens. Um, and with that, like there's not a particular thing with that, but you, that can be a diagnostic in some ways. Um, I don't do it for this reason, but it can be uh, that someone's, you know, at minute three will be like, it's gone. I'm like, is it actually? And they're like, well, you know, it is sort of, but I want to get on with it. I'm like, okay, well, this is a really interesting perspective about the way you might receive touch. Let's actually like not short circuit this. Let's not numb out. Let's not try to get on. Let's, it's still feeling, yeah, it is. Well, let's go back to it. Yeah. So that's a bit of a cue, but it could just be, wow, I felt that, that felt warm. I felt the change. I mean, any number of things could happen. And I said, you know, then I will say to them, you can't do that with every single stroke that I'll do if we get that far, because it's not, even though we're sitting fully clothed, I'm fully clothed, well, I'm, I'm clad. I'm, there's lots of skin, but I'm, I'm not naked. They usually are. Yeah. Um, but to remember parts of your body that still might be feeling the touch 10 minutes later. So just because I'm touching your shoulder, remember your feet and see if your feet are still feeling something and I feel that long tail of touch. Mm. And then after that, I say, well, if you still want to proceed, because I've had women say like, oh, I'm too scared. I don't want to jump out of the plane, which is fine. Like, just because I'm there does not mean that you need to go forward. Like, consent is important. Then we'll get into the space. And then I, you know, my own body work training is my own body work training. Like, you know, I've studied you know, Swedish and Thai and all these different things. And so I wouldn't say that I do Thai massage at all, but like some of the things I do, like when I sit on, when I do blood stops and on the inside of your thigh with my weight. Okay, yeah, that's Thai. But um, I've, say it's a combination of a lot of different things in terms of the stylistic things. Generally start you on your belly, generally start with your feet. Um, and move up and sort of work in halves of the body in terms of left, right, as opposed to top, bottom. Mm. Um, working on mobility, reminding you about uh, long tails of touch, different types of breathing to move air into the lungs when I'm sort of working you in side, side positions. 
and then asking permission about the breasts. Breasts are different than nipples. They each get their own level of, of asking about if they want touched because I can't tell you the number of times I've had women say, I want one breast touched, but not the other. I want mm. a nipple touched, but not the breast. I mean, I've never had, you know, actualized breasts the way that most women do, but I've heard tell and seen my breasts are sore today, or this breast is sore, and but this nipple is turned on. Like, okay, it doesn't happen a lot, but but there are that level of gradation. And then that same level of gradation will happen for the genitals if they want those touched as well, moving from the outside in, moving to internal touch. Um, and then when the session's done, um, I'll sort of swaddle them. I'll then um, close the session by cutting off the threads that have emerged, which of course emerge. Um, and I'll also speak to all the unseen, or not to all, I will try to speak to some of the unseen non-human things that emerged during the session that made it possible for us to arrive. Mm. And so that's hard to say exactly what that is, except for the fact that I do it. Um, but you know, it could be the tattoo on their arm, which obviously means something to them. It could mean the, the salt in their tears that arose. It could be recognizing things in their bedroom, is often their bedroom that you recognize as being sort of uh, totemic. It doesn't, I don't know. I can't say I say to, to speak to every single thing, yeah. but sort of tap into that. And then I cut those ties, so that sort of off ramp. So the on ramp is maybe 20 to 30 minutes. The body work session itself is maybe 90 to two hours. The off ramp part is maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And then I walk out the door. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with so much detail and precision. I think it's it's really helpful for people, especially who are you know people who are not familiar with this work and the depth of it, to understand the level of intentionality and connection that happens in these spaces. It and can. so, yeah, yeah, right. And and to the extent that someone's willing to receive. Yeah, but I mean, you need to like find out about your practitioner. Oh, for sure. For sure. A hundred percent. You need to know more who you're calling in. You need to not just think this is a good idea and do it. Right. Yes. Totally vet the practitioner. Absolutely. Um, you know, something that stands out to me about your process is that you have a, a pre-session exploration to understand more about the client and to share more about yourself, to build rapport, safety, and trust. I love that you have those two games in the beginning because there are so many of us, men and women, that have learned to speed up through life and particularly through sexual experiences to get to the end, to get to the finale, to not feel so unsafe, to not feel so uncomfortable or seen or whatever stories we're carrying with us. And the fact that there is one, a practicing of how to say no, and two, really being present with touch in the body are huge foundational components of what make up, what can make up a meaningful experience for people, be it sexual or non. Totally. I mean, how many times have you, you know, bumped your elbow on the door as you're leaving in a rush and it hurts, but you're just like, I don't have time for this. And yeah. you sort of get on with it. And then two days later, you're like, why does my elbow hurt? Right, right. There was, there was, no, there was no presence in the moment with it. Well, or there was, and there was like, I can't deal with this. I can't, I right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fascinating because, you know, with our bodies, we think we make distinctions of when to cut it off and when to welcome it in. But typically when we cut it off, everything gets cut off. And then when we go to explore touch and sensation in the sexual realm, we wonder why we don't feel anything or why it feels so empty. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, you know, when you decide to make that sort of cutoff place, you cut off the highs and the lows in my estimation. So you, you sort of can't feel anything less than a four because you're like, that just, I don't care. Like I won't feel that hurt. But when you do that, you sort of cut off your ceiling at maybe a seven and a half. And so your joys aren't as high either. And so you're suddenly like wondering like, why is my life in the middle sort of with everything is sort of mad. Like we live between four and seven. Right. Uh, but you know, I don't know if you know uh, the 
the poet writer uh, Khalil Gibran. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you might know his, his piece on joys and sorrows, but it says, you know, your joys and your, are your sorrows unmasked. And that self same well from which your laughter rises was mm -hmm. wonderful with your tears. And how else could it be? The deeper the sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Is not the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? And is not the lute that soothes your spirit the very wood that was hollowed out with knives? And it goes on, but mm. you know, there's a deep relationship with the capacity to actually feel at the range. Wow. Um, not that it needs to be felt every moment, just that it's in your capacity. But when we so habitually cut mm -hmm. ourselves off from feeling, oh, that hurts, to just like, oh, it's annoying, means that you can't, don't have the capacity for joy. Right. That, or, capacity, or a, a higher capacity for joy. Yeah. That um, I feel like I just want to take a moment of silence in what you're sharing because that there's so much more beyond the work that you yourself provide in the world. I can't speak for every practitioner. All the practitioners I've ever known have practiced with epic amounts of integrity and heart. And truly what you're doing, in addition to all of the technical wisdom that you bring, the spiritual wisdom that you bring, is you're helping people expand their capacity to feel and to know themselves and to live their lives. And it happens sometimes to be through the context of touch or working with sexual energy, communication. But I mean, this is the human experience and you are helping people to, to know their human experience. And that's so beautiful. So I'm, I'm wondering as we wrap up here, what is your deepest intention or deepest hope for your clients in the world through the work that you're doing? Um, I mean, my, my prayer for them, and I have many, um, is that they start to develop the a fearless capacity to start to wonder about what wrecks them and wrecks them in good ways and in hard ways and to allow for that blessed making energy to be part of what acts as a as a wellspring for your wondering. Yeah. A fountainhead for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's beautiful to have people in our lives, be they practitioners, friends, partners, whomever, that can hold us in the space and remind us that our capacity is great and infinite and that we are lovable the way we are and that there is a space for our wondering, whether it's a wondering about a sorrow or a joy or about a sexual technique or whatever it is. Yeah. And, you know, I, I see you as a, a pillar of that for your clients. Thank you. I actually would push back on one little thing you said about infinite. Mm. And I think uh, in my experience um not that what i'm about to say is any way declarative but i just i wonder back about it that when you start to get into the notion of infinite joy or just infinite it can quickly take you out of your own experience and you know it's why a lot of people who are rightfully want to do good in the world think of like how do i change the world yeah yeah how do we make everyone do this thing it starts to get really like as opposed to, can I, and of course, like there's that you know, old saw, uh, think global, act local. Mm, like, mm -hmm. Man, I could have local joy, 
if I could have a uh, village minded capacity, which is a, we've never seen it. It's so hard to reckon it. But if I could wrestle with that, to be in a sphere that could have access to it, not even like tapped in universal access to it, just like yeah. access. Um, it's the language of, of the infinite ends up being, a, I, mm. I would say, a bit of a spell um, that we fall under because if it's bigger, it's better, which sounds mm. very arrogant. Which sounds very uh, what we want our spirituality to look like. Only if it yeah. is it true. Right. Well, you know, some indigenous peoples would say, "Oh, you're the sort of person who believes in one God for everyone." Well, that's interesting. We we didn't have we didn't think of that one yet. Um, we just had the one that was just the creator for us and this place, but not like twenty miles from here. Like yeah, there be gods, but. The, the the seduction of the infinite takes us out of our bodies, which again is what we've been didn't even realize we got conned into in the first place. Mm, mm. Yeah, I really appreciate that distinction. I do because there there is a tendency. I mean, I've had the tendency too to hold myself to something that's you know outside of my conception, certainly. Um, it's, I guess a better way to describe that would be our capacity is far beyond what we can conceive of. And, you know, whether we choose to see our capacity and, and really just be with what's there in the moment, which is perfect. There's so much that we're capable of that oftentimes we don't give ourselves credit for. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. There's, um, and you, the, the rubric around you know, depth is one way of saying it, which I don't think is wrong. It's just, that's one way of saying it. You can go down as opposed to in, infinitely out. And there also is a way of sort of like filling in the space because, you know, we, we live in a, like in our, we don't live in a culture, but let's just say that we do. The Western culture that we live in, the dominant culture, um, is in a crater. But we 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 mistake it for a world of abundance. Like there really was uh, a collision thing. That there and we don't even finger the the rim of the crater. We're just sort of like where we are is great. Um, so the capacity to actually fill in what is empty and speak or or to speak to the to the holes is a tremendous wealth. Yeah. Uh, and so. Uh, a properly earned sorrow if you can speak to what's speak to the holes yeah yeah right on wow thank you thank you um so if people want to learn more about you and the work that you do where can they find you um my bodywork website is tantricbodywork.nyc um you know in corona times i'm it's, it's still a big struggle to find an antibody test in new york um and I wouldn't do physical sessions until there, I could show one to someone and they could show one to me just for safety purposes. But I have been doing phone sessions with people. Um, so yeah. And then if people are sort of like, think that what I'm talking about is sort of broadly interesting, my skincare company, um, Primal Derma, you could join the newsletter there. And I wonder a lot about these questions about boundaries and culture making and how it relates to human making and joys and sorrows. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Matthew, for who you are, for the work you're doing in the world and for sharing that with us today. Yeah. Thanks again for asking me. I'm grateful to have been uh, cared about in this way. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for everyone who's listening. Um, I'll include Matthew's information in the show notes. So if you want to get in touch with him um, and wishing you all the ability to witness and be with all of your joys and sorrows. And until next time, much love and good vibes.